Greetings, everyone. eCampus Ontario is pleased to welcome you back to TESS 2021. If we haven't met yet, my name is Lindsay Woodside, Acting Director of Programs and Services with the organization. I would like to begin our regrouping here this afternoon with a land <coughs> acknowledgement. Today, I am located in Midland, Ontario, which is located on land, which is the traditional and treated territory of the Ashnabek people, known as the Chippewa Tri-Council, composed of Beausoleil First Nation, Rama First Nation, and the Georgina Island First Nation. I would also like to recognize that the town is located on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the historic homelands of the Métis. In this virtual space, we are all convening from different places. This is one of the things that makes the online environment special. As such, there has been a link dropped into the chat where you can enter your location, which will find the traditional territories you are located on. It is important to acknowledge the traditional territories on which we live and work as part of our commitment to decolonization and the TRC calls to action. I hope that you've been enjoying the conference so far. From a powerful learner panel, Chris Furland led on Monday, to an inspirational keynote on Tuesday delivered by Dr. Andrew Campbell, to a thought-provoking workshop that I and many of you attended on Tuesday focused on hybrid features for tomorrow's learners. The conference programming has certainly been engaging so far, and it's been a pleasure to meet so many of you in the sessions and workshops. I hope you're getting a chance to network as well. A quick reminder that connections and conversations with others can start and continue in the networking tab found on the left-hand side panel in this conference portal. And today from 4.15 to 5.15, there will be a dedicated time to networking. Uh, so we hope to see you all there. Also in this virtual conference portal, you will continue to find our ongoing VLS, Virtual Learning Strategy Showcase, celebrating the sector's work to date in this space. In addition to upcoming keynotes, panels, presentations, and workshops, which again are offered in flexible half-day afternoon sessions over today and tomorrow to provide options for how you access and engage with the conference programming. As you know, this conference focused on co-creating the future, celebrates and advances community and collaboration across the entire post-secondary sector. I really find it enjoyable, and I hope you do as well, to look at how community and collaboration have come to be uh, and how they have been shaped by the past. And to do this, we can reflect and dig back to our beginnings. This is our seventh year hosting the Technology Education Seminar and Showcase. And I thought it would be a really neat idea to have a longtime eCampus supporter and contributor join me today to reflect back on some of those earlier test conferences. Alyssa Bigelow, who is joining me today, is an instructional design technologist in the Center for Teaching and Learning at Georgian College. In this role, she develops, implements, and evaluates several software and educational technology pilot initiatives. She is also a program facilitator for the eCampus Ontario, Ontario Extend program. And in this role, she creates engaging communities of practice to connect post-secondary faculty across the province in their pursuit of digital fluency skills. Speaking of Ontario Extend, did you know that this is eCampus Ontario's micro-credentialed professional learning program? This fall, we are continuing to offer all six Extend modules as free facilitated courses with optional synchronous and asynchronous check-ins delivered in the Brightspace Learning Management System through December 11th. So you can link up with Alyssa, who is a graduate of the program, as she facilitates a variety of flexible drop-ins if you're interested in upskilling those digital literacy skills of yours. For more information and to register, please visit the link appearing in the chat now. So I have assured Alyssa 
that this is not a roast, <laughs> but rather a toast <laughs> to celebrate her insights and perspectives uh, from Tess days gone by. So here it is in a true rapid fire style set of questions. Uh, this is six by six with Alyssa. So six questions and she has six minutes to answer. So welcome, Alyssa. I'll start off with question number one. Uh, what has been your favorite test and why? Um, thanks so much, Lindsay. Um, this is funny. Um, so a memory came up on my picture wall this morning of test 2019 with my, myself and, and our team members that attended uh, the Globe and Mail Center in 2019. So it was really funny that that came up this morning. Um, I would have to say it would be that one, uh, 2019. Um, it was the first year that um, I was able to attend test as a formal like conference with a program and all of that kind of stuff with it. Um, and the location was just beautiful. Awesome, that's great. Thanks, Alyssa. Next question too, what has been the best test conference venue so far? So perhaps it's that one from number one, but I'm not sure. Maybe you have something else up your sleeve. <laughs> Um, so going back, um, we had um, George Brown College's Lakefront Center, which was absolutely gorgeous. The views are stunning. Uh, 2016, we had Maple Leaf Gardens, uh, which was wow. so cool. Um, it was a little bit of a weird setup, but it was so cool. Um, I would definitely have to say um, it, would, it would be that one because uh, the building just had so much history and it was a really cool experience. So Maple Leaf Gardens it is. That's awesome. Number yeah, I guess three. it's not called that anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> Question number three, what is the one thing you miss from the face-to-face -face conference? I miss the snacks and the, the lunches. <laughs> <laughs> they are notoriously good. I agree. They're super good, yeah. You guys and kept one, this fed very well, yeah. <laughs> one thing that you're embracing in the virtual conference space. I really like the networking um, area. Like, I think it's um, I think it's such a great idea for people to connect when we can't do that like we normally can. Um, the test conferences have been so great to um, re-engage with with people we haven't seen in quite a long time. So um, that's a really great thing. Question number four: What was one of your most memorable test moments? <laughs> All right, I'm going back to 2019 again. Um, 2019, uh, Tess had an afternoon session that was uh, the Ontario Extend Experimenter Module Crash Course, uh, basically is what it was. Uh, and we were all um, trying to work in press books. And um, unfortunately, there were so many of us there, it crashed uh, the system. And we just had kind of like this system-wide um, outage for a little bit, but our eCampus folks responded and reacted like so good. Um, and, you know, they contacted Pressbooks like directly and, and they were able to um, get us back up and running so that we were able to continue with the workshop for the afternoon. So it was, that was really cool. Yeah. Many eCampus staff will remember those moments um, fondly, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, and number six, why is TESS so important for our sector? Um, it, again, it comes back to the community building, I think, and the, and the connections, um, especially right now um, with everybody kind of being dispersed into screens. Um, the TESS conference just has so much relevant and important information. Um, the keynotes are, are so um timely uh they're they're perfect for for the conference um and there's so much there's so many projects going on right now uh with all the vls um opportunities and it's just incredible to be able to catch up with folks and see what everyone's doing and and bounce ideas back and forth thanks Alyssa. i want to sincerely thank Alyssa for joining me this afternoon to kick things off i'm not sure she entirely knew what she was signing up for when she agreed to co-host. But as always, Alyssa rises to the challenge and her contributions to eCampus Ontario over the years have been so appreciated. With that, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jenny Hyman, Dean of Academic Excellence and Innovation at Cambrian College, 
whose pleasure it is to introduce and moderate this afternoon's keynote focused on hybrid futures delivered by Dr. Valerie Irvin. Jenny, over to you. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you, Alyssa. It's always nice to think back fond fondly on other eCampus Ontario test conferences. It's been a lot of fun. Um, so it's my privilege uh, today to share some pre-session information with you about Dr. Valerie Irvin. Valerie is a professor and co-director of the Technology Integration and Evaluation Research Lab, TIE, which is fun. I probably, they probably have a lot of fun with graphics for that, uh, at the University of Victoria. She has been teaching online and open courses at undergraduate and graduate levels since 1998. Preceding the current post-secondary trend of hybrid and flexible learning, Valerie developed the multi-access learning framework in 2008 with funding from the Canada Foundation for Innovation and has modified and explored that framework according to her active teaching practice and in partnership with many other scholars. The purpose of the framework is to describe and support options for faculty to help create effective multi-access courses in order to support learner personalization of learning modality. And this is, couldn't be a hotter topic in post-secondary right now. Valerie is a highly respected and well-funded researcher in her areas of expertise, and she is the president of the new Congress Association, the Open uh, and Technology and Education Society and Scholarship Association, better known as OTESA. Uh, and many of you who are open educational uh, practitioners will know OTESA. Uh, as a new great organization. She practices an inquiry-based approach to teaching through a trauma-informed lens. Valerie welcomes connections and can be reached at her email and Twitter, which we will share in the uh, link section for you. Um, and she's agreed to be with us today to talk about her experiences and perspectives on teaching and modality. So welcome, Valerie. I very much look forward to learning with you. Great. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a privilege. Um, I am going to just share my screen first. And there we go. Um, and I'm going to put a link in um, the chat for folks to access uh, throughout the program. Um, going in to present. I love this picture because it does kind of capture the binary thinking, you know, of, of and the choices that we're, we're providing to folks. Um, uh, so before we get started, though, I do want to acknowledge, um, you know, for me in Victoria, that um, I like to acknowledge the, the Lekwungen peoples and the Songhees, Wasanic and Esquimalt peoples, um, whose traditional territory I and my family live and my work at UVic is situated. Um, and I do want to recognize the privilege that I have um, being here today and the impacts that colonization have had on the community in Canada. Um, on the traditional lands. Um, and I do my part to support truth and reconciliation and decolonization. Um, and I do support um, uh, if um, you can put the, the folks who are local to you, the Indigenous people who are local to you in the chat um, to um, share your, share your uh, acknowledgements as well. So, um, in that link, you can access all of these slides. Um, I haven't finished doing all of the alt text uh, tagging on it, but we'll do so after the keynote to make sure that they are um, accessible. Um, and you can access my Twitter and my email there. So at UVic, I have a few different things I usually do. One is to um, teach a blended course that is a core ed tech course in our teacher ed program. And by blended, I mean it's consecutively face-to-face -face and online. Um, I'm a coordinator and supervisor of an MED cohort, um, and that is a program where we offer a mix of multi-access courses and online-only courses. Um, supervise MA and PhD, um, have the TIE lab, and I'm on sabbatical right now, which is wonderful. Um, and it also creates opportunity for me to connect with you to collaborate on research or discuss teaching or happy to explore consulting as well. Um, uh, this is Otessa. You can get more information on the slide link. We do have call for proposals due December 15th, and um, I'll leave this information there for you to access on the slides should you want to join us. It isn't just about open. It's a, a group about technology and education, scholarship, and society. So anything ed tech, online, and open or open um, is welcome. 
So um, also watch out for today. I have an article that's getting published um, with Education Canada. It's a kid field oriented um, piece, but it is looking at why not to give up on online and, and hybrid learning. Um, and it has a paired podcast. So if you would like to explore more that those should be circulated today. Um, so I do have participation tips. Um, and I do this because when Zoom shuts off, we all get severed from each other. So um, that Google uh, link provides us uh, a shared space where you can access the slides um, to a recent article that I have on merging modes. And then I have prompts throughout. Um, so if you want to participate in a prompt, you can click to skip down and enter in here. And when I did a, a keynote at Dalhousie, I was in the document for an hour after the talk, connecting with people. Also at the bottom, you can find um, my personal Zoom link. So um, we can have a post um, debrief uh, conversation if you'd like to join. So just wanna make sure that you're aware of that. Okay. So you can use the Zoom chat and I'll try and keep an eye there, but uh, for ongoing, we can have uh, responses to focus questions or post event work as well. So I wanna go over my sort of story of like, exploring modality, uh, so providing a little bit of a history and context, um, because we were basically thrown into it as a field. Um, we've typically had a binary of face-to-face -face courses and online courses, you know, for much of um, post-secondary history. Um, our banner system, this is an old example, where, you know, we had to choose face-to-face -face or online when we mounted a course, and face-to-face -face provided us a time and a location but online what was very frustrating for years was we had time no time and no location which um, i find a bit of a struggle when we want to explore designs that um, aren't any time anywhere because you're kind of you have no time together and you're nowhere together so i like to explore um, how do we discuss blended learning and how do we um, oops I think we just skipped through blended learning, which I see as a consecutive merging of those modes, not concurrent. And hybrid in the literature and forever has been a synonym to blended. So similarly, I see hybrid as a consecutive merging of um, those two modes. Um, in 2006, I got um, a lot of funding um, from the Canada Foundation for Innovation and with matching funds got over a million um, to really just play. Um, explore and um, and that actually helped me develop uh, the ideas um, and and work through the pedagogical sort of implications of merging modes. Um, this was the lab that we created back then, and you can see in the far um, image, in the far screen, um, it's a picture of a boardroom with um, in the screen a, a satellite classroom with round tables, um, and there is a. a, a a screen on the side. And one of the things that I learned was the importance of actually being able to see chat. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I came up with multi-access as a way to refer to the merging of modes and the layering of modalities and access, because in the literature, everything that was hybrid or blended um, referred to the consecutive mixing. So it's kind of extending terminology then. Um, I, I see it as a how do we, if, if we're at brick and mortar institutions, I see that as a, the center of this image of a globe and how do we peel back and increase the layers of access to synchronous access to asynchronous access and then also looking at open access and engaging open learners um, and taxpayers who should have a part of our, um, you know, as John Walensky would say, um, you know, academic discourse is a public utility and so I do believe that if we're passionate about open access research and publishing, we should also take that same approach to the educational resources um, that we are creating as well. Um, I've had a, a it, was, it was a conference in Hawaii, so it was a little bit sloppy and done at midnight, but I do have a proceeding from, I think this was 2009, uh, on looking at transferring the locus of control uh, of access to the learner. But I, I don't really, I'm not fully in the camp of going full high flex, which is a type of multi-access, which is letting them fully choose. And there are some pros and cons of that in design. Um, there's a link if you want to flash back in time to 10 years ago, 
on a Change 11 MOOC where I discussed multi-access learning. Um, and you know, it was a time where I think a lot of people thought it was a little bit crazy. Um, you know, what do you mean bringing them in together? But um, it's, uh, we're here today and there's so much work to do. And um, unfortunately, just like folks who are frustrated with online being maybe misbranded and should be called um, emergency remote teaching, I kind of feel the same way with what's happening with merging modes and what's happening in terms of um, uh, <laughs> poor design. Technology amplifies anything, good pedagogy or bad pedagogy. And uh, I think we need to be slow and careful in how we move forward. Um, I'll put the links in the Google later. Um, Google document, but this is a um, article that I published in 2013 that introduces um, multi access learning and the idea of the MOOC craze back then was it was all about having these one off courses and very, you know, specific things mounted for open access where I believe that again we're public utility. So how do we look at having open access and creating every single offering permeable in terms of open access so. Um, there is that layer to multi-access learning where um, I'd like to see us move beyond just the modality of synchronous or asynchronous or face-to-face -face and, and look at that extending as well. Um, we had a two-page spread in the Global Mail that didn't understand us at all. They put it down as open learning platforms in Canada. I'm like, well, it's not really open. It's a closed multi-access class, but whatever. I'll take the press. Um, and uh, there is a, a piece in... Um, uh, Claire Major's book on teaching online that you could uh, access. It's in our library for uh, an online mode. Um, so you can probably access it at yours, hopefully. Um, but I go over um, examples of three different multi access courses as well in there. Um, Matt Bauer and his team in Australia um, came up with blended synchronous learning. And um, so there's this website, blendsync.org, that folks can access to explore that. Um, and um, at U Michigan, uh, there was John Bell who came up with Synchromodal. Um, later, he rebranded it to Synchronous Hybrid, which I always thought, if we already have blended synchronous, why create another term then? <laughs> why don't we, we need to fold in at some point? So there were really four early players um, in, in looking at merging modes from the you know, mid 2000s, I don't know what you call it, the first decade um, uh, in the 21st century, I guess. Uh, Myself, representing Canada, Brian Beattie in the US, John Bell in the US, and Matt Bauer um, in Australia. Um, and so I'm happy to be a woman representing in this mix. Um, and so we, Brian Beattie and myself, were the first two coming out in the, in the field on this. And then John Bell and Matt Bauer followed um, a number of years later. Um, and we all came up with different terms. So I chose multi-access, Brian Beattie chose high flex, and implies full control for, by the learner in terms of choice. Um, John Bell and Matt Bauer are focused on the synchronous merging. Um, so um, those are some of the terms that are out there. But so I'd like you to maybe consider going in the, the Google Doc and the link um, is in the chat. And if you join late, then um, maybe someone can put the link in there again. And if you wanna skip down to prompt number one, and the, this resource can be available you know, afterwards, or if you're watching this asynchronously later, um, you can come back to this document and, and share your own thoughts. But um, skipping down to prompt number one, um, why did all of these early scholars in merging modes not use hybrid and not use blended? So if you'd like to put some of your thoughts and guesses as to that. I can watch the Zoom chat as well, but it'd be great if you could use the Google one for continued access. Not terms that would have been well known related to learning. Most still learning face to face. To avoid confusing with face to face. Perhaps the terms are too limiting, and that's a good thing to explore as well, which you will. Okay, so I will let folks 
continue to chat and come back to this after later today in a break. Um, I will also be watching this or feel free to tag me on Twitter or email me if you want me to come back and look at a question or um, comment. So I actually tweeted this in a, when I had a bit of a mood <laughs> back in 2013, blended is a dead term. Um, and I would actually say so is hybrid because it's a synonym for, uh, for blended. If blended or hybrid means everything from consecutive mixing of face-to-face -face online modes, for concurrent mixing of face-to-face -face online modes, for mixing online asynchronous and synchronous, what does it even mean anymore? What is it communicating to the learner? What's expected of them? Of them? What's it communicating to the instructor? How is our system dealing with understanding this? Um, if we're going to actually have terms mean so many different things that really in the end communicate nothing other than a sprinkling of mixing, um, then maybe we shouldn't even have any term. Maybe we need to pull back and just say, here's learning and put a label of all the different layers that uh, we provide. That or we need the terms um, to communicate specific um, designs for people to engage in. It's something that, I mean, I don't have an answer yet. This is, this is the why. Um, and what does rebranding terms mean for the history of research work or for our shared understanding at that? So in Google Scholar, if you look up hybrid learning, there's 3 million something results and blended has about a third of the amount of results. Um, and that's going back to, we're talking uh, like decades ago. And so if you wanna search and explore what does blended now mean or trying to find a specific design, it's like, good luck. <laughs> You're going to be sifting through so much stuff if it all is now merging into a variety of different designs. Um, so this is a um, word cloud of just some of the terms, not all of them, there's more, I kind of stopped there. Um, some of the terms that are used um, regarding mixing modes. Um, so it's, it's a lot. Um, we have synchronous hybrid mode, neutral DTX learning. We've got trimodal, bisynchronous, and it's exhausting. Um, so a year ago, I published an article in Educause Review um, where, uh, and I'll put the link in the, or I think it is in the Google Doc, where I present my framing of the semantics and of the modes and provide a bit of a history moving through, um, which I recommend you might want to to explore or share in your networks. Um, and there's a lag, there we go. So focus question number two, um, in that article, I pull out um, a, you know, a, you might guess it's a tier one university in Vancouver <laughs> had a program and it was trying to communicate the program delivery. Um, and the quote that they had was, the cohort will include face-to-face -face instruction and courses taught in a centrally located Vancouver site and flexible blended formats that mix on-site and online learning. So many of you are in Ontario, put on your learner hat and take a moment to read that and think about what are you committing to if you do enroll? What's expected of you are you expected to be bum and seat for all, some? What does this mean? And I'd like you to take a stab in the document. If uh, you had to go sight unseen or not able to call and clarify, do you know what you're committing to? Are you gonna be buying a plane ticket and getting accommodation to be able to participate or not? So we have comments. It's more than a bit unclear. <laughs> and uh, they said, I suggest the pro program committee might not know for sure either. Someone said there's an expectation to be on site at least part of the time. Um, someone said I would need to live in Vancouver, but also have you know, access for flexibility probably. Um, and someone said I would have to be on campus for some of the courses and then be able to do some of them online. So already right there, what does it mean? And if we don't have clarity, anytime we post a program, think of our support staff and think about our program coordinators, uh, the sheer number of how many inquiries are going to get from, oh, it's hybrid. What does that mean? Even when I spelled things out, <laughs> I still had to clarify with a couple of people, um, you know, about what online means. Um, folks, when they hear online, they think anytime, anywhere still. So if you do have a synchronous portion, you have to spell it out. 
um, if it's a requirement. Um, if it's high flex, communicate what that means that it's you know fully um, letting the learner choose. Um, but I would actually argue that very few programs actually out there give that full learner choice. Um, they are out there, but I do know a lot of programs and they aren't full learner choice. They are allowing some choice um, and usually it's in the synchronous piece. So let's look at learner perspectives. Um, in that 2013 little study, I asked them to rank their pre preferences for modality after having taken a multi-access course um, with us. And nine out of 15 that responded, and it wasn't a big class, ranked multi-access as their top choice. Um, and then three selected blended, and then two selected face-to-face -face and one selected online. So actually when we pick a uh, you know, one of the extremes of that binary, what was a binary before, um, those are actually the lo lowest, you know, the fourth and fifth choices. Um, and when we looked at um, where multi-access existed at, in terms of the first or second choice, um, 14 out of the 15 chose multi-access, whether they're in the face-to-face -face group or remote group as their choice came in the first or second choice. So they were quite comfortable with it. Even I remember one person who was very face-to-face -face oriented. She said, I wouldn't want to ever be online. I like always being in the class. And she said, but I, I actually feel like I get my needs met this way. And I know that someone living far away or having a need is getting their needs met. So I'm cool with this. And so that was, you know, a, a nice thought. And, and if looking at the impacts, we had learners with physical health obstacles that wouldn't be able to come in in, in person. Uh, we had someone whose parent um, had a sudden cancer surgery and they, um, if they dropped out of that three week course, it meant pushing off the practicum and getting a job by a year. They were able to hang on, the parent was fine in the end and they moved on to their practicum. So physical health is key, remote and rural. I always have a bit of a Mm, annoyance with our brick and mortar institutions being so closed um, because our taxpayers come from beyond the urban areas and they do not have a university in their backyard. And the universities that do offer online programs, you know, for example, Royal Road's great, but they charge three times the tuition that UVic does. So if you are someone from, you know, who has, has a special need or remote and rural, you're actually being dinged more for the access that you need. And I, I think that's an issue. So we also have to focus on inclusion, different special needs, anxiety being just one of them um, for learners who may not be able to come into a face-to-face -face, um, area. Um, and so um, there are all sorts of ways that we can support it. And time is an interesting one, saving time. We're all so busy. <laughs> and when we talk to learners, we had, um, uh, one actually was very specific and said, uh, my learner preferences depends on the length of commute. If it's over 45 minutes, I prefer online. If it's under 45 minutes, I prefer face-to-face. -face. And so we actually, and we need to consider climate change and what's happening in BC right now is just heartbreaking. Um, but we, be, specifically, I know in our grad program, we had one learner drive nine hours each way once a week to access our core grad courses just to be able to do the program with us. Another one drove two hours um, and they're folks who ferry over from Vancouver to access our, um, our program. So we have to think about what are we doing to the climate when we're making people commute so much. Um, so putting all of these things together, the student pressures, the social justice, navigating the privilege that uh, you know, we are expecting, um, it's it's a lot on the learner and, I, and this is why I truly believe in merging modes and even from a selfish point of view when I was in uh, Alberta um, I remember taking my doctoral program and finding the first term courses were all online and then that I was frustrated because I just moved from Vancouver um, so I wasn't happy with the modality pushed on me and then when I moved to UVic um, it's a small city right on an island we don't have the same like massive population base for our programs and there were wonderful people from beyond who were like, oh, I'd like to study with you. I'd have to say, I'm sorry, our core courses are face-to-face. -face. So again, modality choices came back to bite me again. <laughs> so this is why I'm interested in this. Um, Jordan Tinney is a, a superintendent in um, Surrey or was, 
um, and Shelley Moore is tagged here. This is her image. And I like, she's, she talks about inclusion in K to 12, but I want to come back to her image and look at these um, circles um, with the green dots inside being the learners who can be there and look at inclusion and exclusion from a modality access point of view. So when we offer face-to-face -face only, we are the exclusion circle with all the colored dots on the outside. Segregation is when you have this little small circle on the outside. So that would be like, maybe we'll have an online section or, you know, maybe that is how we do it as a system. That's Royal Roads over there and Ubic is the, is the bigger circle. We stay separate. Integration is multi-access learning in one of its um, designs and that's embedding it in. And one might go, well, what the heck is inclusion, right? I would actually say inclusion is the telepresence robots <laughs> and the cyber proxy being supported of people being fully embedded um, because we do have embedded versus embodied um, um, participation. Um, and it's a bit different from video conference versus telepresence. Um, um, but when we look at, again, learner perspectives, I. Uh, sharing these photos with consent, this is personalizing modality. So we have different learners in a multi-access course, probably telling people their modalities are different than each other. So we have the top right corner is the face-to-face on-campus pod with people sitting around a table in a video conference room. And every day they come in, they sit bum and seat and they leave. And so that is a face-to-face -face course really in their lived experience. Um, the top left, we have a remote online pod, um, three learners from Fort uh, St. James Secondary up north in, uh, in BC. And so they are doing an online course, but they also have this small little face-to-face -face posse that they get to enjoy some of that energy. Uh, and then uh, the bottom left, we have the remote online individuals who really the entirety of their program, um, uh, Benjamin there is from Manitoba and Trevor is from Prince George you know, they basically engage it as a fully online program. Um, so that's their lens. And then on the bottom right, we have someone who's experiencing it in a blended format because sometimes she comes in person and sometimes she comes in online. So it would be a blended experience. So we have to think about the learner's perspective of modality and not just the institution or instructors, um, you know, messaging from their lens. So focus question number three, can you think about a case where a learner was unable to access education due to modality or inflexibility in learning design? And if you wanna share what were the obstacles and what was the outcome, but minding confidentiality um, and not to like call out people per se. Transportation from a neighboring community to attend in-person classes, that's definitely an obstacle. International student without access to Wi-Fi to attend online or watch videos, yeah. And multi-access doesn't have to be all online either. There is this idea that people use online to mean not on campus. <laughs> so um, the Pacific School for Innovation and Inquiry in Victoria, it's K to 12, um, Jeff Hopkins refers to their design as multi-access, but what they mean is learners can be present, they can sign themselves out and be at the library, they could learn from home, you know, uh, they sometimes will video in for a quick call or telephone in, like it, it really means the modality doesn't matter. Learner, learning is where the learner is, and um, so it doesn't, um, and then that's also for supporting, I was on a flight with someone from Finesque, and we had a long conversation about like, how do you do online learning that supports, you know, the in indigenous community? And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be online all the time. So yeah, accessibility challenges are mentioned, students with young children. Oh yes, I know that. <laughs> um, when I got the grant in 2006, that was the birth year of my second child. So that was a wild time. Um, working individuals who can't attend the class during the day, many rural learners. Yeah, there's so many obstacles and I'll come back and, and, and explore and respond after our talk today. So instructor perspectives. Um, we had one learner trying to come in to the synchronous live sort of video class 
from the side of um, a rec center sort of um, pool, their kid was actually in swimming classes. And you know how loud that is, right? So it was really jarring for the class. And others might try and come in from a coffee shop um, over Wi-Fi there that is all shared. So if you are going to be moving into the space, it means our course outlines have to also change. And that means putting in some standards and expectations for engagement to make sure it's successful for the learner, as well as not um, problematic for the class when it comes to audio um, and the moving camera <laughs> that's always going somewhere. Um, you know, it, it's it's it, it's uh, something that needs to be addressed as well. And people don't often think about that. So if you're not aware, now you are. Um, we also have instructor ideas around the expectations of the remote learner. So this was um, in one class names uh, like they, they created popsicle sticks with um, learners on it and they basically moved them aside when someone in the remote group talked and if they didn't talk they called on them because they didn't know are you really there are you like going off to the living room or you know and they wanted to have that kind of accountability and you can see the attendance sheet there as well so um, some people have that kind of mindset. And, and I, as a parent of, some, uh, of a, someone who has um, anxiety and you know, I've had to homeschool in the, in the K to 12 system at different times due to school refusal, calling on people randomly is not something that I see as an inclusive approach for teaching. Um, and also there are instructors who want learners to have the video on so they can see them. And in fact, one group expected that the, um, the cap for remote learners was the number of people that could appear on a Brady box, you know, um, Zoom window at one time, not more because they couldn't see them online all the time, you know, <laughs> watching you. And so we have to think about how we support learners who may need to have their cameras off, you know, whether it's for not wanting to share what's in their backdrop or maybe it's to handle their anxiety. Um, it's really important for us to look at this kind of. Um, you know, a, approach. Um, and then there's instructor perspectives. I have um, a wonderful person from our first Thai grad cohort who is in Vancouver and um, amazing person. And I wanted to connect him with a prof in our department. That prof was like, oh, I'd love to have a coffee with your learner or chat sometime. And I said, great, but it's online. He's not in Victoria. And then the offer was re rescinded. And that frustrated me because I thought, really, you're going to be conditional based on if you're having the person in, you know, in your office versus on a video screen or a phone call. And the response was like, I don't I don't like online learning. You know, I have a family member in another country and I can't, you know, it's not the same. Like connecting over video is not the same. I can't like hug them. I can't. And honestly, I, I don't think we're supposed to necessarily go and hug all our learners, right? Like it's not an expectation for an academic environment. Um, and so are people taking their biases around personal experiences and, um, and applying them to professional uh, settings? So um, no, we do not need to hug and kiss and cuddle our learners, but we can support them having access to help them improve their life situation because education does elevate income and pro by providing more access to credentials, we are supporting learners, especially with those with um, disabilities. There is this other thing, this image here is, um, I've got Bueller's um, uh, character, the teacher that's uh, um, boring. <laughs> and we have a, a very um, uh, happy fellow, looks like he's having a deep belly laugh. And I call it sort of like that idea around the Bueller effect and laughter and teacherless sessions and open mics. So, when I'm in an online only course, everyone mutes their mics, right? You're all muting right now. Um, if I crack a joke, it kind of sucks right now. I don't get your feedback and I'm not hearing other people laughing. Um, so in those spaces, I, I like to have fish bowls of people with unmuted mics so I can hear some humanity. And in multi-access courses, I think what's rich there is the face-to-face -face group. If they laugh, you can look on the screen and you can see all these people who have chosen to mute their mics and they're, they're jiggling too, they're laughing and they actually can hear laughter. Maybe their voice isn't part of that collective laughter, but that's doing something magical for community building 
that is better in an online space than the, the silence that we have, you know, almost like the silence of if we're in outer space. And that um, that's something also beautiful to consider when you're um, a benefit of multi-access learning. So um, when we have, um, someone has a laugh track, that's awesome. Um, so in our 2013 first pilot that was in that Jolt article, um, the, the retired principals, they taught after being petitioned by learners. They had like a petition of 80 because they were expected to come to Victoria, come back for three weeks in September when everyone else is descending on one year leases, who's gonna give you three weeks? Um, and after that experience, they all requested the multi-access sections and the department expanded to six out of our eight cohort sections um, of that course, six out of eight were multi-access. I mean, part of me is like, well, at some point, I mean, do you just say here are face-to-face -face ones and here are online ones? Do you need so many mixed modes? Um, in that program, it wouldn't have changed the diversity, but multi-access courses changes the diversity on campuses. And I love that. Um, so that's a beautiful thing. They became advocates. Another example, we had an instructor refuse to do a multi-access option for a core course for the person driving the nine hours, the one driving the two hours, and the one with autoimmune uh, disease still said, no, don't wanna teach in a video conference enabled classroom. Um, but they supported that nine hour drive person coming in on a telepresence robot and they loved it. And they advocated that the second core course instructor support them coming in on a robot. So, you know, it, I, I find it's interesting. The more people have access to experience things, the more they're open to it. And um, this is why in, if, if I had any kind of say on campus, I would be making every faculty meeting, every department meeting, any kind of meeting set multi-access to be more inclusive of people's voices, um, to be inclusive, especially of folks who cannot afford to buy close to campuses anymore, or um, need to commute in that we, we keep them involved in our um, leadership on our campus, but then also they'll desensitize and understand oh, it's the big deal, <laughs> right? And, um, and co-teaching, I had a new instructor teaching a cohort in an intensive summer course, same time as me, partnered and we basically did it together. She loved the experience, is all full game on it. Um, and so that pairing can help, you know, putting them in on their own is a very scary thing. And even the retired principals, they had my um, PhD student, they, they wanted, the first one wanted the PhD student just to sit in the class the whole time you know? <laughs> and just be there. And, and that's the kind of anxiety we have to uh, understand. But after a little bit of in, going into that, they're fine. So it's just simply a transition. So another question, do you teach a multi-access course? And um, how do you use it? So if you wanna put some thoughts and sharing in there, um, I'll come back and check later. Um, and I'd like to hear how you, how you use it. And while you're going in that, I'll, I'll move forward and look at room design pictures. So uh, at UBC, there's only one medical program in BC. And um, with, um, all of these people wanting to be doctors descending on Vancouver to become a doctor. Well, doctors can afford to live in Vancouver, so they stay in Vancouver. So it doesn't address the shortage of doctors that we have in more rural areas. Um, so they set up um, uh, a multi-access format with satellite campuses. So they video conference enable every lecture hall, um, even their cadaver rooms, they control cameras with their feet and they have the you know, the gloves on and they are zooming in with high definition mic or cameras from overhead to look at what's going on um, and they share it across sites. So, I mean, they might have more by now, but the ones I know about is that they have the Vancouver main site. They have one at UVic, a building that's at the Island Medical Program. They have one at UBCO in Kelowna and one in Prince George up north at UNBC. So, um, and they're doing that and they're finding it's working that the learners are staying in or near the communities um, of their satellite campuses. So this has been going on for quite a while. And this is sort of a look at some of the large lecture options. Um, I'm not sure I like all the mic approach. It's done in a, anyway, it's a side story. I can talk more if you're interested later. But our audiovisual folks on campus 
like to design boardrooms. <laughs> so this is one, I mean, we're stuck with the shape of this narrow room for one of our video conference rooms in the Thai lab, but um, I wanted to take this picture to sort of capture this sort of uh, boardroom style and um, and the, the challenges we have with that. And we need to have more pedagogy folks mixing with the audiovisual folks to influence the design. Um, Alec, I think you're in the room. This was like one of the times you guessed it in where we had a satellite classroom and we moved our chairs around and people could sit where they want. Um, and we have, these are our current rooms that now have been created and expanded and are free to book, free to book. And that was thanks to Paul Stokes, our former CIO who said charging for this is not working. But my preference is that we have a third room dedicated to displaying the chat. And the reason for that is um, otherwise everyone opens up their laptop <laughs> and they're all gonna be in the chat. And um, it kind of it, it kind of takes away the conversation when they get sort of buried in there um, and they start doing other things on there. And, and, and we want, I don't know, I, it's, maybe it's my bias, but I like seeing people looking around more at each other and looking at the screen to engage our remote learners. And also it becomes a, one of the design considerations is power, that they can access power um, on the grid. And if they're not having their laptop on the whole time, then they don't need to have the power so much. Um, and they can just look at the chat and respond orally if needed. Um, they move towards more regular kind of classroom style rooms as well. So there's iterations that are happening. And then there's the cyber proxy, which um, actually does, it might think, oh, it's expensive. It's not. If you redirect the $200 that accessible learning centers charge for a note taker getting a random note, for accommodation, it's much better to be present and all you need is Wi-Fi, um, robust Wi-Fi, um, and you can actually access a class through another means. The problem is these are one-to-one -one things. I want to try and work on a design where we have a few people that can come in on one robot, and not just one-to-one. -one. So, and this was Matt Bauer coming in at a conference we were all presenting at in Las Vegas. No, I don't know. Rich was there. I don't know where it was, <laughs> but uh, lots of options. And this is John Bell getting carried away at UMichigan. And I look at that and I go, I think that's not, no, like that's that, that's a hard no for me. But then I also have to go, OK, is this a modality bias? At some point, do I have a modality bias? But it feels like why not just do an online class? So let's talk about bias then. And um, a lot of people have a stereotype of modality being um, online being not good and passive and face-to-face -face being this rich, wonderful experience. And these are the images that kind of correspond to the stereotypes. Although it can flip the other way, you can have online learning environments and this is a multi-access um, setup actually in that, that image at the top. And then you can have really boring face-to-face you know, lectures that are passive. Um, so it's not really the modality that's an issue, it's the pedagogy. And then people will have a modality bias. They'll think face-to-face -face all the way, right? And others, you know, or, or the same people will think online is, you know, sucky. Um, it flips. We have many learners out there who are not into face-to-face -face and they want online, value online. And for many, they need online. It is simply, I can't do your program unless it's that. And we are, again, um, marginalizing people when we um, do that. And we actually marginalize someone anytime we pick a modality, to be honest, which is like why I like merging. So if we group these, it's really about passive pedagogy and active pedagogy and how we design the pedagogy. Um, and this matrix kind of puts it together. Like we want to actually design so things are on the right side. Um, showing the um, engaged people and happy and laughing and talking and um, not the bored and I'm falling asleep in a lecture hall photo um, or, you know, gazing at my screen. Um, so question, do you have any modality bias? How has modality bias affected your campus, your learners, your instructors? What, what's your story on, on your bias? If you wouldn't mind putting some things in the chat. Yeah, someone said, yes, I miss being face to face. 
Yeah, so do I. I'm stuck in the same room for way too long now at home. Um, yeah, I'm seeing lots of people lamenting at the two year gap and, and missing out on the face to face. Someone's sharing that they have a campus bias to face to face. Yeah, worry that they will take away the gains from new possibilities, yes, and reverting right back, which is where that article in Education Canada that's coming out today that I wrote is pleading not to go back, not to snap back. We got to keep iterating for it. And if we think about it, for, you know, K-12 teachers, uh, when they do a practicum, they're failing all the time, right? And they don't snap and go, oh, I'm not going to try and iterate on my failures face to face. They don't question the modality they're given. When you're a new prof coming in um, to campus and higher ed and may not have a teaching experience, they probably have plenty of failures. There isn't a, oh, well, but I'm not gonna continue, it's face to face. Like um, we need to have the same kind of persistence when we are exploring with modalities that are online or multi-access or some other sort of uh, way of, of connecting. We need to learn not to stop um, on that. So someone said, after this experience, definitely multi-access bias. Someone prefers the face-to-face, -face, but appreciates the flexibility and feel like there should be more going forward. And that is definitely a theme, um, definitely a campus bias towards face-to-face. -to -face. Someone said they preferred online and they have a bias for online learning to support and working um, uh, and with learners who need freedom of place and pace and time. Yeah, oh, campus bias or face-to-face for money for parking and resident. Yes, there's a whole economics thing around face-to-face -to -face too. Um, so I wanna look at learning design and iteration, which I just sort of alluded to a bit. Um, oops. So when we talk about pandemic teaching and digital tools, these words on the left, flop, terrible, overwhelming, regret, embarrassment, exclusive, they're all real and valid. When we look at the words on the right, transformative, empowering, exciting, access, innovation, inclusive, those are all real and valid. So what we need to do is where we have the left words, you know, those negative experiences, we need to look at iterating and sharing those failures so others don't repeat it and working towards the, the right side, because that's what we do in face-to-face -face context. We work to get to the right side. Um, and so um, we need to look at that, that saying about fail, meaning first attempt in learning, not to quit, not to be like, you know, we don't do it when we start teaching. We don't do it when we start with K to 12 learners on Practica, we push through it. So um, and I'll put some links here for folks to read later. Um, there's a no significant difference phenomenon about learning via different modalities. So check the bias. There's plenty and plenty of literature that says, you know, there isn't a significant difference provided you actually are designing it for the same type of pedagogy. But I'll leave those links there um, for you to access later. Um, so I'll share with you my favorite design. Um, it's blended, blending the synchronous and asynchronous in a course. So not doing full instructional hours all the time uh, that are assigned. Having whole group synchronous, mixing the on-campus and online learners. Um, decentralized synchronous pods for small group conversations. I'm not a huge fan of breakout rooms. I do them sometimes, but I'd rather just shorten the class and put the breakout room on the pod to set up and meet at their own time in the week. And they love it. It's like every single time that formative and honest of surveys midterm, love the pods, love the pods, made friendships, more bonded during the online course than they've been in face-to-face. -face. Um, and also using the asynchronous designs of blogging and a back channel, we use Mattermost. Um, these things I've, I've reached 5.0 out of 5.0 teaching evaluations with K-12 teachers with half remote, half in person, which I'm surprised. Um, and this is my happy recipe. But again, everything's going to have to be, what's your context? Like, I'm not in a large lecture hall. I'd have to have that experience to make suggestions. Um, but this is what 
my face-to-face -face intensive summer course five days a week for a few hours a day would look like. I'd shorten the synchronous times each day and I would take two days off and make them asynchronous only. So we connected briefly for an hour and a bit, three times a week. And the rest was around that with small decentralized synchronous groups and the asynchronous connections. If you look at the three hours of instructional time, it's, it's sort of split into one, it's always one in 15. I plan for a one 15, <laughs> but let's say one hour whole group video classes. And you could have some breakouts in there. Um, I prefer to actually engage with remote guests, um, synchronous decentralized learning um, pods. And then um, one hour um, is the back channel, the blogging, the annotating resources and reviewing the video or other resources on our course website. So this is kind of a image of what it looks like, the, the video enabled multi-access space, the learning pods with their own, they need their own access to Zoom, and then in the individual connections, so student to instructor, student to student, and student to expert. And then when you have a guest, you can read the paper and you bring in the guest. And that makes for a really excited and get engaged community because they are reaching beyond um, you know, the context of the class and connecting with experts and um, from whether it's research or practitioners, experts from around the world. So that's um, my synchronous is like the whole group time mixing, the modes, the breakout group groups, and the guests, and the pods. And I love assessment meetings, um, doing one on one with groups, um, uh, sorry, one on one meetings with learners or meeting with groups, uh, meeting with pods. And I use Calendly for that, which is a really great. I do the cloud consent piece. So this is our um, a closer picture of our cohort, cohort shared with consent. And um, we have about a half and half model. We actually had 13 online because someone from UBC wanted to join us. Um, and it is increased access for rural people like the Fort St. James teachers, increased remote access. We had a Manitoba teacher, equal access. We had teachers with accommodation needs and little kids. So, I do believe there's a, it's almost like it spins and iterates on itself. Tech integration enables better collaboration and then collaboration enables better tech integration. So it starts, I don't know, working on itself. So we had collaborations, um, sorry, between uh, teachers uh, across districts, not even meeting each other, doing their master's project together between districts. Looks like I have a little bit of a lag. There we go. And between rural and urban teachers as well. So, and that's a beautiful thing, like getting that expertise into campus. And so I'll put these links here on this slide um, for some of the projects that you can see and what we brought in from the folks up north on an amazing Truth and Reconciliation Project video documentary masterpiece where they worked with learners to create a wooden feather that had text on it that embraced their, their hallway. Wonderful stuff. Um, we need that on our campuses and urban areas. Um, so asynchronous, I look at course blogging, winter blogs, doing blog feeds, hypothesis for markup, Trello for project supervision, Google Docs for collaboration, Mattermost for the back channel, and then optional for Twitter. Um, and that is great. But keeping in mind, we also need the openness. And I don't teach in an LMS at all. <laughs> I haven't for like, decades. Um, and I started teaching before Marie Goldberg created that. I've tried it a couple of times to keep pulling back out. Um, and so it, it comes back to open access publications. We should also have the same mindset toward teaching resources. And so we use a blog hub where we aggregate all of the posts by our learners blogs. Um, so we have their feed. So there's open sharing of their learning learner journeys. If they consented, they can choose to not have a public blog or a share in some other way. Um, and then we have, um, this is our master's cohort site. We use the same site and we shift out the teachers on the blog, not shift out the learners to different LMS shells. We keep one place and it grows. Um, so you can see the different courses that can accumulate on archives on a blog. And so that, that's been fun. Um, and then this is another example of the list of people who shared um, their blogs publicly and then the access to the feed and our menus. And on our undergrad course, we do the same thing. Um, we Creative Commons license our work as well. And we have other universities who have said, hey, I'm kind of lift it. I go, you don't even have to ask, it is Creative Commons license. So 
you can and attribute our, our stuff. Um, and then you may have heard about the Open ETC here in BC, um, doing wonderful work, the Open Ed Tech Collaborative with creating blog um, clones of WordPress um, sites. So we have a number of them here. Actually, all of our Ed Tech courses are on here. Um, and this is an example of our learner template for 336. So it's not a steep learning curve. They jump on there. And this is important for multi-access because it's important to create an asynchronous foundation, a strong one for engagement. And that's just my opinion. Some people do the black hole classroom where they do their synchronous time and they leave and there's nothing. But um, again, this, this is a strong way of building community no matter what their mode is. And then they iterate. So this is someone who's changed the images, changed the menus, then they can slowly change it, but it's not such a steep learning curve and they own their data. We also use um, uh, blogging because this is a picture of my own kid's note shared with consent. She's in university now. Um, for the quiet learners who need a place to share. Um, she actually had a blogging assignment in elementary, senior elementary, and at 11 p.m. at night was sliding this note under my door saying, please, can I do my blog? She found a way to express herself. So, and this is still true for university learners. They need to express themselves. And how many times I've heard that our course helped them not have a breakdown that term. It helped them have, you know, improve their mental health through the reflective practice and having a space. Like I actually believe that space makes it a safer space online. Um, they have their own way of connecting. And we use Trello for project management. So this is an example of working through an inquiry project shared with the learner. So you're co-creating the curriculum. And this is one of our ed tech MED students that just kind of took it on and <laughs> went wild for planning her work. And then you can pop in and see what's happening. So focus question number six, I know I'm gonna have to stop for questions here. Um, so maybe if you could put this in that, what do higher education institutions need to do to support multi-access learning and learners? And what problems and difficulties do instructors and learners report in these classes and how can they be mitigated or overcome? If you can put those in, then after the keynote, I will come back and reply and share my understanding of how I would overcome those things as well. But I do hope you'll engage there and, and I'll connect after. So in summary, looking forward to the future. Um, hats off to um, Julia um, Forsyth for doing this sketch note of one of my keynotes. It's looking beyond blended. Um, and it's looking at how can we create more flexible environments, looking at how we present our courses to the public and to our learners. This example, I keep picking on UBC because I, I did my, I did two degrees at UBC. So <laughs> I feel like I can as all my matter. I get in trouble if I picked on my own, but um, looking at how we market it. So if you see here programs, graduate, undergraduate, international on their website, professional development online. Well, what if you want graduate and you want online? Where do you pick? This is a classic double-barreled item. What does a learner do? How do they know? Like, I just want to do graduate studies. I want to be able to find a pathway where I don't have to come to your campus. Um, and so we need to look at how we share on that front. Um, we need to look at our banner systems, how to improve that, make sure our online learners in multi-access classes aren't paying on-campus fees. Um, and a variety of different shifts for that. Um, but it does impact recruitment and retention. When we choose the multi-axis design at the bottom, we engage learners who are online fully, face-to-face -face fully, or in video pods um, at sites um, beyond our own campuses. And the financial model briefly takes $100,000 to set up a decent video conference classroom. Um, our cohort runs with full capacity, 25 out of 25, with a 75% rejection rate. Our counterparts that are face-to-face -face run half capacity. And I did the math and the difference of their cohorts and ours is we bring in $100,000 more over the two-year term of the program. Um, and that's only using that room an hour and a bit once a week. Considering all the other hours that could be filled with courses, that's a potential of up to $2 million in differential revenue of just filling up classes if they are similar to our scenario path full. Um, so, I mean, whenever people balk at text costs, I always say they have to pause and think about it. 
even with the note taker for the $200, it pays for the robot in the first two terms and it lasts longer than that. So in your strategies, find ways to make your core courses inclusive, either have a multi-access format if there's only one section or provide parallel online options, let them choose. Um, and then also consider senior courses. I know we have attrition in fourth year computer science because they get jobs, but then they can't stay to finish the face-to-face -face fourth year courses. So we need to find pathways to make sure everyone's included on this. So I'm gonna leave the focus question number seven. What do you think is the future of multi-access learning in higher ed? And I can't wait to get to the doc to be in there and debrief with you and go in my video room to debrief with you. Um, and, but I, I have an English grad, I have a BA in English from UBC way back. And so yeah, Jane Austen and all sorts of writing, I love it. Um, but I love this quote. So I'll leave it to you with you. Um, the distance is nothing when one has a motive. So I think it's time that we have a motive to push through and iterate and not snap back. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Valerie. I'm taking a look in the chat and I'm not sure if I'm, I'm not seeing the correct chat, but I'm not, I have not yet seen questions in the chat. So if folks have questions, there's, now there's is the time. Sharing, which is what I, I love to hear. Yeah. But yeah, if people have questions there, I'll go back and I'll comment on comments um, from my observations. But yeah, folks have questions. Thanks, Elon. All right, it's kind of quiet still. Well, I'm happy to connect if folks want to email me, um, vervin at uvic.ca or reach out and DM on Twitter. Um, is multi-language possible in this form? Ah, oh, that's interesting. I actually have a, a doctoral student who's an um, uh, English language learner. And it was one of her things actually, um, it's not actually merging the languages, but I'm, there is technology for translation and there's captioning. So there may be, but I haven't had to explore that yet. Um, but she was interested in multi-access learning because she, when she emigrated to, I think she was into Manitoba where she landed, um, all the language learning courses were face-to-face -face and she had little kids at home couldn't learn English, you know, trying to find different resources. So we need to think about how we are actually supporting English language learners and making sure they have access to, um, because I think we see our, our campuses as destinations for these international students to fly in and be on site and learn. Um, we need to support those who actually can't come on site. Oh, I can put the URLs in the Google Doc for all of the courses so you can check and, and follow along and a number of them are active right now. We have many electives that are cross campus. Um, those ones are online, but the multi-access ones um, are more the grad ones that we've done and some of the undergrad ones in our teacher ed program. But I'll give you all of the links. Yeah. Yeah, and have, follow up. I'm happy to have a conversation with you too. Um, and also I've got a sabbatical, so I'll be doing a lot more research. So if people want to partner with, you know, me um, working with you to study what you're doing in your context, I'm happy to do that as well. It's, I just, you know, everyone's passionate about not having online rep be ruined. <laughs> Again, I kind of feel like I don't want multi-access learnings rep to be ruined either. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of lit that actually will say the remote learners feel not engaged. I'm like, yeah, that's to do with the pedagogy because our remote learners are quite happy and they're they're so bonded sometimes, like even with um, two learners, you know, that were in different cities that worked on their full project together. And, you know, they're they're the they're besties. <laughs> so it, you can create community in, in in different modes, but you have to create a good design for it. So whenever you hear that, check that that's a bias. Oops, it looks like I lost my, oh, 
Our instructors and faculty were the key first skills to learn to engage in teaching this teaching modality. Um, first skills, asynchronous skills. It's easy for them to, um, uh, I'm gonna zoom in here, there we go. It's easy for them to um, get lost in the asynchronous world. Um, and going into a video conference classroom and teaching like they were just in that one time, synchronous only and leaving and blackout classroom, that's something that's easier for them to do. But the asynchronous part is hard. The LMS the, is hard, the blog is hard, the, um, the, the connecting on back channels is hard. So that's, that's what's hard for instructors. It, and granted, the one I partnered with that came in, she wasn't so much engaging asynchronously, but she, they were still happy with the course. And honestly, if they were getting a face-to-face -face course, it would have been the same kind of thing. It would have been um, coming in to a classroom on campus, leaving, seeing her the following week, you know, and not having much going on in the in, in, the in between. So um, yeah, so that that would be one of the things that um, I would focus on is is you could start with that blended synchronous only, like those two, two modes just merging synchronously and let go of the rest and slowly add it on or make sure they've got those supports with someone else leaning in with the asynchronous side. That's where the that's where this learning curve is with uh, digital literacies for them and, and uh, pedagogies for that. Awesome, thank you, Valerie. I think we're getting ready to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your open sharing as always in your scholarship um, and sharing all the tools that you use for what you do. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to eCampus Ontario to confirm breaks uh, and things. And thank you for the opportunity to continue in the Google Doc to share ideas and to interact with you. So that's the place to go if you wanna continue the conversation. Definitely, I'll watch the doc and also I'll join the Zoom link that's at the bottom of that doc if anyone wants to come in and chat and debrief after. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you so much. Take care.